This is a story about how um, a, a road trip in India led me to Japan. When I was in college, I was a comparative religion major. My focus was uh, Indian religions, mostly Hinduism and Buddhism. And I had an opportunity to spend a summer in India where I lived with a very devout Hindu family. The father in particular was very devout and very into his Hinduism and didn't understand why I liked Buddhism and would always tell me about how Hinduism was better than Buddhism and more true than Buddhism. So we would have these ridiculous debates about that. Um, he would take me to all these Hindu shrines and I would say, well, that's great, but we really should go to Bodh Gaya as well, which is where the Buddha achieved enlightenment and it's sort of become the Epcot center of Buddhism. <laughs> There's a... Uh, there's temples from every culture that has a major Buddhist element in it. So he agreed that we could do that, and he and his wife, Rashmi, and their two little girls and I got in the car very early one morning, about four or five in the morning, to start the six-hour trip to Bodh Gaya. So where we were, from your perspective, was here, and there's an old silk road that's literally just like a line of asphalt that goes through dusty nothingness for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. And you take it for five hours, and then you go north for half an hour, and you get to Bodh Gaya. And then it just, otherwise it just continues across the subcontinent. So we're driving and driving and driving. They're all chatting with each other in Hindi. And at a certain point, I think I see the Bodh Gaya sign go by. So I said, well, aren't we supposed to turn off there? And they said, oh, we have decided we are going to take you to Benares. <laughs> and I said, OK, why? And they said, there is a very sacred temple. We'll take that. We'll spend the night in Benares, then we'll come back to Bodh Gaya. So I said, okay, so how much further is it? And he said, it's about another five or six hours. <laughs> so we keep driving, there's no air conditioning, the, so the windows are down and it's very dusty and these two little girls are being so good. We have with us all the water that we're going to need to drink on the whole thing. I can't get water anywhere except what we actually prepare at home and all the food that we're gonna take with us. So we drive for five or six hours, we get to Benares, which is its own story, but the short version of that is we get there and they won't let me into the temple because I'm not Hindu. So Kuldip is ashamed and outraged and has a little temper tantrum in front of the temple and says, okay, now I don't like Hinduism anymore, now I like Buddhism. <laughs> so we go, we drive through Benares to a little Buddhist town and we take a look at the little Buddhist town and he's really liking Buddhism now. And the sun's about to set and we've been in the car since before dawn. So we're driving back and I'm thinking that we're staying in Benares. We drive into Benares, we drive through Benares. We're leaving Benares is in the rear view mirror and I said, what, aren't we staying in Benar? I will not stay in a city that will not invite my spiritual sister. And I said, oh, oh, okay, so if we're not sleeping in Benares, where are we going to sleep tonight? And he said, we're going to drive to Bodh Gaya. Oh. <laughs> so we, another five or six hours on the road, windows down. We've run out of water. We've run out of food. These poor little girls have been so angelic. And oh, that was the first one. So we get there. There's no room at the inn because everyone's in Bodh Gaya this month. There's one little hostel that the student hostel schools out, so it's totally closed down. The groundskeeper takes pity on us and allows us to stay in this one bedroom without, where there's no sheets, there's no mosquito netting, there's no running water, there's no working bathrooms. It's really miserable. We sleep for a few hours, wake up. It's a pretty miserable day. We get to Bodh Gaya, which is fantastic, but we're all kind of wandering around in a daze. I'm practically dying of thirst at this point. We walk around to all the different temples, and then we walk into the Japanese Buddhist temple, and it's clean and it's air conditioned, and when I ask for a cup of water, they have a filtration system, and the only place in India where they can just turn on the tap and give me a cup of water right out of the faucet. So as soon as I got back to America, I went to my, the head of my department and said, not doing the India thing anymore, I wanna go study in Japan. <laughs> Several years ago, I decided I wanted to go to Paris because it was a lifelong dream. I didn't have any money, but I did have a credit card. I didn't know anybody there. Um, I couldn't speak French, but just a little bit. And um, so naturally, that was my key to get my airplane ticket and take off. And uh, the first day I was there, um, got in, spoke a little bit of French to people, found my hotel, checked in and went out for, um, for a walk around the area where I was, which was Montparnasse. And one of the things I really like to do is take pictures of cemeteries, you know, the funeral art in cemeteries. So I found Montparnasse Cemetery, which is pretty amazing, and I was there for ages just taking pictures of this one and that one. 
And the, it's in two parts. The second part, the old part, is surrounded by a high rock wall. And um, I decided to go in there and I got totally wrapped up in what I was doing. I didn't notice the time. I didn't, and I continued taking pictures until suddenly I realized that the place was closed. The gate had been closed and locked. It was too high to climb. <laughs> and the gate was, it's solid. You know, it's not just bars, it's solid. So I thought, what the hell, I can sleep, but you know, it's nice weather. I can sleep on a grave. Nobody's gonna bother me. It's nice and safe here. Um, shortly thereafter, a guard came up and she said to me, I don't know how she knew I was American, but um, <laughs> she said to me, the cemetery is closed, the cemetery is closed. And I said, and I am inside. <laughs> So um, she let me out. She actually shooed me out. I wasn't that eager to leave. Um, went and met a friend for dinner who had come over with me. And we went for a walk near the Sorbonne. And the first thing we did was run into a student demonstration, which was terrific. I said, it's the 60s all over again. We got in the middle of it, and I had my camcorder with me, and I started shooting. And then people started playing to the camera. and. Uh, it was, you know, a good time was had by all. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. I wasn't always a Yankee. As a matter of fact, in the late 60s, I lived in another exotic location, not India, not Paris. I lived in Durham, North Carolina. Yes. And I was in North Durham, North Carolina, the night Martin Luther King was shot. And that was a very interesting evening because here I am, I'm looking out the window, and there are cars roaring by. They're on two wheels. Some of them are filled with black guys with shotguns. Some of them are filled with white guys with shotguns. I was an academic. I went out and got a fire extinguisher. But anyway, I lived in North, Durham, North Carolina, and I moved up to Yankee land. So let's fast forward to the 80s, mid-80s. And I find myself in New Orleans, Louisiana down at a convention. And some of my colleagues, uh, the insurance commissioner of Nebraska, the executive vice president of a very large insurance company, other research economists, our buddy, who is a real Cajun uh, financial guy, decide they want to go to Fred's Lounge in Little Mamou, which is about 175 miles up the bayou in the middle of nowhere. Well, with these guys, I'm always the designated driver because I want to arrive alive because these guys are always completely blasted. So we drive 175 miles up the river. We get to Little Mamou to uh, Fred's Lounge, from which they, from where they broadcast the Cajun radio hour every Saturday morning. And it's great. The bartender, the bar wench, actually the bar grandma, runs around passing out boudin sausage. Everybody's drinking real cheap beer. And, you know, it's at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they have a terrific band, and every once in a while they start broadcasting things. The only words that I recognize in the whole thing are uh, bedroom suite. It was obviously an ad for something. Okay, but we, we finish a big, pardon me, at Little Mamou, and the Cajun says, I know this place for lunch. It's a fantastic place. So, okay, jump in the car, and we all pile in, and we drive. Now, the roads are getting narrower and narrower. The Spanish moss is hanging lower and lower. The road is getting bumpier and bumpier. And as we wiggle our way down through the swamp, we get to this village. The cars are all rusty at, up on blocks. The barefoot children are playing in the dirt. The one-eyed dogs are wandering around. And there is this restaurant down at the end. Well, that's cool, all right. So we walk into the restaurant. But it's also a point. We walk into the restaurant, sit down, and the owner is there. The owner is this little scrawny guy. He got beady eyes. He got these little horn-rimmed glasses. He's wearing a red check shirt and jeans. He looks like everybody's idea of the grand clique of the KKK. All right, the scary guy. So we sit down, we're starting to have lunch, and plants out the window, and this enormous Cadillac tools up. And a very large black guy gets out, and his wife gets out dressed, honest to God, like Aunt Jemima, and the two of them come up to the door. Well, I am ready to hit the deck, 
because I don't want to be in the way of the next shotgun blast. And the bee little eyed guy gets up and he runs to the door. And just as I'm about to throw the table down as a barrier, the door comes open and I hear him say, Good afternoon, two for lunch, right this way. And that's when I knew that the South had changed. When I was, uh, when I was in uh, college one summer, my roommate and I uh, went backpacking and hitchhiking in uh, Europe. And uh, after a, a few weeks on the continent, we headed for Ireland, and the plan was to hitchhike as quickly across England and Wales, the Hollyhead, to get the boat to Dunleary, and, and then we would take our time coming back and see England and Wales at that time. Uh, and, and everything went fine. We got right around London, we had good rides and everything. And as soon as we got to Wales, everything just went into slow motion, and we couldn't get rides, so we got very short rides. And people are driving by and shouting obscenities at us, giving us a finger and stuff like that. And it was a little disconcerting. And uh, uh, our second night in Wales, we're in a little town, uh, a little fish and chips and just getting something to eat about 7.30 at night, uh, figuring we're going to walk out of town a little bit and find a quiet place and roll out the sleeping bags. And uh, I noticed there's a man outside with a, 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 with a dump truck, and the tailgate of the dump truck had broken and was hanging down, was covering his taillight. And he couldn't lift it up and hook it with a chain at the same time. And uh, so we watched him for a few minutes. I thought, well, maybe we have to just bar it. Maybe that's how we have to get rides around here. So I went out and I asked, how about if we help you lift that up and hook it? Would you give us a ride? He trucked his point on the right direction. He really didn't want to do it, but I said, okay. So uh, so we helped him do that, and uh, we went to get in the truck. He said, no, no, we, this. So we had to ride in the dump, actually. But uh, it, it wasn't anything in it. It was empty, and he hadn't been hauling more, so it was okay. And, uh, and it was a great ride. We went for miles and went through a whole number of towns. And uh, a little after 9 o'clock, he pulled over to drop us off. And, uh, and it's pitch black, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, this is far as I'm going. I said, come on, nobody comes here. And, and Charlie said, no, over there. And you can see way off the road, the lights of a farmhouse. So that's what, where he was going. So we got out, and he went home. And uh, we thought, well, maybe we should just try a few, wait for a few cars to go by. And if nobody picks us up, roll out the sleeping bag. So, uh, and with that, two cars were coming. And uh, at first, they went right by. They didn't even slow down. The lights hit us, and they thrown right by. So we walked a little longer, and then there's two more coming. Uh, they're about 200 feet apart. And uh, the first one, as the lights hit us, uh, they started to slow down. I thought, maybe we'll get a ride. He kept slowing down. He got almost up to us, and an arm came out of the window, and he threw a beer bottle at us. And uh, he hit me right in the shit. Hurt like hell. And I went, ah! And I took my, uh, my weight off that leg, and the pack pulled me right over and fell on my back. So I'm laying in the back of the room, and uh, Eddie, my roommate, is like, Joe, are you okay? And, uh, uh, and with that, the second car is coming along now. The bottle didn't break. It bounced off and it's spinning around the road. That one comes along, sees Eddie standing over me, and they hit the bottle and it explodes under their wheel. And they continued down the street, but uh, put the brake lights on and kind of went around the corner. So I got up and said, OK, maybe it's, maybe it's time to roll out those sleeping bags. And uh, we had been walking along, and there were, there were pastures there. And you could hear animals running away. And it, we assumed they were sheep. You couldn't see them, but it sounded like sheep. Uh, and uh, a lot of them, a lot of little ones. So uh, we decided, well, let's just get over the wall and roll out the sleeping bag. So I got up on the wall, and I'm trying to climb down the other side. And I thought I'd just pop down to the pasture. So I hopped off the wall, and uh, lo and behold, the pasture was about five feet down from the wall. So I thought I was going into a bottomless pit. And uh, Eddie's like, are you OK? <laughs> Everybody ain't sick saying that. And uh, so he climbed down very carefully. And uh, we're rolling out the sleeping bags, and you could uh, now we're below the road, and you could see more because the, the sky had a, uh, it was a little lighter than the trees, so you could see silhouettes. And here's a guy sneaking up the road, uh, very quietly coming up the road. And so uh, I was said, I don't think he's going to ask us if we need a ride. <laughs> and so we're quiet, and he went by, and then a few minutes later he came back and went by again. And then we heard him hauling and said, no, they're gone, they're gone. So, oh, God, so, we rolled out the sleeping bags and tried to get some sleep. In the morning, where uh, 
this probably happens to everybody. You're you're in a dream and you hear a noise, and you try to work it in the dream and it just doesn't fit, and, and you wake up. Well, that's sort of what happened to me. Suddenly, I'm awake in the sleeping bag, and I have the bag right up over my head, and there's something right outside the sleeping bag, and it's going. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, am I actually dreaming? <laughs> and I pull down the sleeping bag, and we are in a pasture, but it's not sheep, and it's a bull. And he's, he's pouring the ground and snorting and doing the whole thing, the whole package, and sort of standing almost right over us. And I look over at Eddie, and he's like, this is. and I don't know what to do. And so finally, we just started hollering. Screaming at it, shouting obscenities and waving our arms, and, and he backed off, and we 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 got out of the bags. And once he got off, off the top of us, more or less, uh, you could see he wasn't full grown. He was a smaller bull, and we roll up, got up on the road, started hitchhiking again. Cars are coming by, and they're you know giving us a finger and what have you. It was uh, part of the course. We walked for several miles, came to a bus stop outside of town, uh, waited for the bus, took the bus into town. It wasn't too far to a train station, and we took a train to Hall Ahead, and we got to Ireland finally. Uh, I've, I've traveled pretty extensively since then, but I have yet to go back to Wales. <laughs> uh, but it, it is on my list. <laughs> so the next guy, uh, tell you, we invited him. He heard about it. He's like, absolutely, he'll he'll do it. Um, so I want to give you, uh, I want you to give him. A very warm welcome for the uh, mayor of the great city of Newton, Woo! Mayor Teddy Warren. Hi, good evening. This is the scariest, most intimidating thing I think I've ever done in my entire political life. Um, okay, do I begin? Yeah. Jared, start. I heard about some bells and some other things. I'm a little scared about that. Um, so I have a very brief story to share with you. Um, it's the story about um, a young woman that I went to college with named Maura DeVito. Uh, she and I uh, were at Boston College together. Uh, we didn't really know each other all that well, but we got to know each other when she moved uh, to my street on Beaumont Avenue in Newton uh, with her husband, Jason. Uh, they moved to our street about six years ago and they had a daughter the first year that they moved to Beaumont Avenue named Ellie. And we got to know, I got to know more again through our relationship as parents and friends. My wife, Tassie and I and Jason uh, and her daughter, Ellie, and my daughter, Abigail, and my son, John, all became really great friends. And we had a great little neighborhood of kids and parents sort of hanging out together, uh, spending Halloweens together, going trick-or-treating together. And Maura was sort of the ringleader and got us in a lot of trouble over the last six years, uh, just uh, with the kids playing outside at all hours of the evening. Uh, she was a real life force. Well, last year um, in September, we learned uh, that Maura had uh, terminal cancer. And um, her daughter, who uh, last year turned four, um, and her husband learned of this news. And um, in November of last year, Maura uh, passed away. And she actually passed away on November 23rd, two days from now, from a year. So I've been thinking about her a lot. And um, the sort of extraordinary part of this story is really more as in our relationship from September to November, towards the end of her life. Um, she was so giving um, and so full of life. Um, she was con always asking how things in the city were going and complaining about things on Beaumont Avenue, including the street. Um, but she always uh, was trying to do things for other people in our neighborhood up until the moment that she died. Um, and we just remember her because she was just such a giving person. So just a few points um, in sort of thinking about this story as we go into Thanksgiving uh, that my wife and I 
as I thought about this story, I wanted to pass along to you and for me. Um, first, it just reminds us of how fortunate we all are to be in this great community and have friends and family. So the first thing that you know I wanna pass along to you that I think about that it, this reminds me of is to be thankful and grateful for what we have. The second thing is uh, to remind ourselves to do things for others. These small things about asking how our friends and family are doing. Uh, reaching out to people maybe that you haven't seen in a long time um, that you think about but maybe that you haven't reached out to. Um, just thinking about that. Uh, the third thing is, you know, just thinking about uh, these incredible organizations that do things uh, for health purposes and, and cancer. I ride in the past Pan Mass Challenge every year. This is my fifth year riding for Dana, Dana Farber. And um, thank you. And this year's ride was really special for me because of Maura. Uh, so the third thing I would say is just when you think about, when you see these charities and you see these you know, organizations like Dana Farber, think about doing something for them. Think about sort of lending a hand for them. And the last thing I would say is, you know, think about more. You know, think about Ellie, the, the little girl. Think about that family. Uh, think about um, particularly Moore's spirit and how you can sort of be captured by that, you know, towards the end of her life. Uh, her daughter's doing really well right now, by the way. She's at Cabot in kindergarten, and uh, we've all reached out to sort of help Jason and the family. Um, but, you know, think about how that Shmora lived and think about um, how you can sort of take that spirit and pass it along to your friends and family. So uh, we should be thankful. We should be grateful. Uh, thanks for giving me the few minutes, um, and uh, it's great to be with you tonight. Enjoy. happened to me on the road was I was driving on the mass pike when my car started to overheat. I didn't want to stop, so I just turned on the heater. I had a, I had a trunk full of marijuana. <laughs> there was no name on that one. that ever happened to me on the road was on a small Cessna plane in the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean window missing, saran wrap instead. <laughs> then after we took off, the only pilot fell asleep. <laughs> Fortunately, he woke up before landing. <laughs> I'll do one more here. <laughs> Worst thing that ever happened to me on the road was we were driving in Guatemala and got pulled over by a soldier carrying a gun. Oh no, we were scared. All he wanted was for us to give him a ride to his friend. <laughs> of course, we said yes. <laughs> so, you know, all of these, you can all, whoever wrote these, come on back and tell us the whole story next time. These are all great stories. Right? Um, so, when I was 18, um, I saved money up and, with my best friend, bought my first car. And that was a 1972 Chevy Beauville. It was big it was a big van extendo van and we took out all the seats and we put bookshelves in and we put a futon in the back <laughs> and we got two more of our best friends and we headed out to discover america um we cut all of our hair off first so we were three freaky women in a puerto rican <laughs> and so for that reason we decided not to go south and to go west <laughs> And we did that, and we went west, and we would uh, just pull over and camp. We didn't go to campsites. We were spending all of our money on gas because the Chevy got nine miles to the gallon. <laughs> and uh, so we would just kind of pull over in places and, you know, and sleep in the van. Um, and we were in the middle. We were driving on a mountain. I don't know what state we were in. We were, we were way out. We were kind of looking for a campsite, and we were way, way out, and there was nothing but mountain and trees and stream and we pulled off and it was a beautiful beautiful spot and we um we decided to have a picnic there and possibly camp there and we just pulled off the road and we started making our lunch 
and we were there for a while and um, there was definitely some weed smoked and there might have been some drugs consumed and we were there we were sitting around the van there's nothing but trees and we're all thinking what if the Buddha should come walking out of the woods right <laughs> now what would the Buddha say to us and we're all thinking, what, like, what would you do if the Buddha came out of the woods right now? And, and how would we know it was the Buddha? And we're all sitting around and we're talking about this. And like, you know, Miguel's like, um, is, is there someone over there? And he was the jokester. So we were like, yeah, the Buddha's coming. And this guy walked out of the woods. <laughs> we're like five miles from anything. And this guy comes walking out of the woods. And so the Buddha um, wears um, knee-high like rubber boots and um, like canvas work pants and a plaid shirt and a cap. And he carries a, a fishing pole, apparently. And he, he came up and he looked at us. And we were just like, what's he going to say? And he was looking at him. And he said, you stuck? <laughs> We said, oh, no, we're, we're having a picnic. And uh, he's like, well, did you try getting back on the road? We're like, um, no, no, it's, we just pulled off. We're not stuck at all. We just, we're having a picnic, and maybe we're going to camp here. And he's like, why don't you try? <laughs> we're like, you know, okay, like one of us gets in the car and uh, we, we, you know, start to, and the, it's mud. We are literally 10 feet off the road. We are not moving. The wheels are just spent. Nothing. Nothing. He's like, I'll be back. And, he <laughs> and a half an hour later, he comes back with a, a, a giant, a truck and um, a winch. And he'd strap, he straps a winch to a, a giant tree across the street, and the chain goes down, and the chain attaches to the frame. And uh, one of us, the smallest one, who was Max, got to drive, and the other three got to be, you know, with the shoulder against the back of the van um, and covered with mud, and she's driving, and he's winching. And this was an hour and a half. <laughs> it took us an hour and a half to pull the van out. Um, if he had not come, we would, the van would still be there <laughs> um, in the woods, nowhere. Um, so he spent an hour and a half um, winching our car out back onto the road. And I'm sure he went home and was like, yeah, I spent two hours, like, you know, dragging three freaky women in a Puerto Rican out of the woods. <laughs> um, but to us, it was like the Lord however you understand him and the universe, how you experience it, provides in mysterious ways and in forms you might not expect. Um, and so when the Buddha comes out of the woods, when you meet the Buddha off the path, do whatever he tells you to. It's the first time in a long time I've walked up to a mic and someone's cheered. So that's just, but, Thank you, Jerry, for having me. How many people here got an email from Jerry saying that you are the number one storyteller I hear. <laughs> you really need to come to this. And I'm like, oh, Jerry, absolutely. And I don't know who was telling him I'm the number one storyteller. But um, I, I did, uh, in one of my previous lives, do a lot of auctioneering. I don't know if anybody that do them for the PTOs and the schools and things like that. So. I'm going to auction off some rugs. I don't know if Scott knows how to do that, but uh, I, I, when you said storytelling, I said he must think I'm thinking about the auctioneering, to be honest with you. Um, so I was trying to think of a story to tell, so I was jotting down some notes about different stories that I had, and four or five of them I definitely could not tell, um, and I decided on this one. So there was this one time, I'm sure a lot of you know that the mayor and I, I call him Seti, the mayor and I went to high school together, we graduated high school together. So there was this one time that Seti and I were in Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that story. I'm just kidding. So um, the story that I wanted to tell, so I'm trying to think about a story. 
I'm trying to think about keeping it to five minutes, which I, I can't, but I will do my best. <laughs> I tried to think about something true, definitely true, and I was definitely on the road. So I wanted to just take two minutes to tell you a little bit about uh, the probably the best 24 hours of my life when I went to pick up my daughter, who was adopted. And uh, she was adopted uh, out of Indianapolis, Indiana, which mm -hmm. where my wife is from, Indiana, so it was all kind of really coming together for us. So it was our anniversary. It was August 31st, 2011, our anniversary, okay? We are home. It's our eighth anniversary. We're talking about, you know, uh, you know, where should we go for dinner? And, you know, what do you want to do? Blah, 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 eighth anniversary, dead of uh, summer, right before Labor Day weekend. So she said, I have no idea. I don't know what we're going to do. Whatever, whatever. So the next day, uh, sorry, that was Tuesday. I apologize. That was Tuesday the 30th. Next day, I go to work. I'm at work thinking about where we're going to go to dinner that night. Uh, it's about two in the afternoon. My wife calls. I'm expecting she's going to tell us where we're going to dinner uh, for our anniversary. She says, are you sitting down? I said, I am sitting down. She said, I just got a call. I just got a call about a baby girl who's in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we have to go get her. And I said, are you kidding me? I, I didn't know really how to react. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. We stop back with our board meetings next week, and we got committee meetings, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and work. She's like, Scott, this is the call. This is what we've been waiting for. You know, it was just the initial shock. So, okay, I'll be right home. She's like, I'm heading home. We've got to get a flight. Uh, I'll meet you at the house. I said, fantastic. I stood up. And I see that, by chance, the human resource director is walking down the hallway, and he's looking in my office, and I can tell that he sees that I am definitely off. <laughs> and he comes into the office and says, is everything okay? I said, I said his name's uh, Amoroso. I said, I just got the call. I said, I'm going to have a little girl. And he said, oh, what the hell are you doing here? He said, get, get out of here. So I left. I shot home. I walk in the door. My wife is in front of the computer. We're trying to get flights. My wife, who is the most organized person in the world, has just paper all over the floor. And she can't process what she's trying to do on the computer, so I'm trying to help. And anyway, we, we are arranging flights. We're getting, you know, in the age of text messages, we're getting um, uh, a text message from our liaison in Indianapolis. And he texts through a picture of my daughter oh. on the phone. And my wife just lost it. And we are, we're, you know, you're trying to do it. You're hugging. You're crying. You're trying to type. And there's tears falling on the keyboard. And then we got a picture of the birth mother came through because she wanted us to see her and vice versa. It was just incredible. We couldn't get out that night. So you can imagine what we're going through that evening, hoping that it's still going to go through, hoping that, um, you know, in no time short, she will be in our arms and we get a flight the next morning, 6 a.m., we got to go through Washington out to Indianapolis. That was the best we could do and how we arranged everything. So we get on the flight. We're at Logan. It's 4.30. We get on the flight. We hit uh, the flight. We hit Washington. The minute we get into Washington, now it's 6.40, 6.45. It's not a long flight, even quicker. There's seven voicemail messages. My wife is, again, she is white. She is thinking that maybe someone changed their mind. Something has happened. I, I don't even want to look at my wife after she tells me this. She starts listening, and the color all comes back. It was her sister. I can't believe this. This is the greatest thing in the world. What are we going to get her? What are you going to name her? What are we going to do? Should I pick you up? Should I bring something to the hospital? I... And these are all separate messages. <laughs> so, we switched the flight. We boom. We're out to Indianapolis. We are drove to the hospital. We get in the hospital. We walk in. Um, um, you know, that flight is just the most amazing thing in the world because you're thinking about all these wonderful things that are going to happen for the next X amount of years. We get into the hospital. We get met. We go upstairs. And, folks, I got to tell you, if, if you haven't been through this or you don't have someone that's been through this, it's just the most amazing feeling in the world knowing you're going to walk in this room 
and your life is changing forever. Your life is changing as you, as you walk into this room and, you know, you pull this curtain back and there's a woman standing there. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. We walked in that room and my wife and the birth mother completely embraced and just had this mo most incredible moment. And I'm standing there like an idiot because I got nothing going on. And I look down <laughs> at this bassinet and this little baby who usually just kind of, you know, they, you know, you know the look. But she just happened to look up. And she looked up, you know, back and at me. And it was just, I, I just have that vision in my head like it just happened an hour ago. It's the most incredible thing in the world. And we had this most incredible three hours with the birth mother. We had the most incredible two-week stay in Indianapolis because of, for whatever, you know, legal reasons you can't take her out of state. And we just had the most incredible time. And now she is the most gorgeous three-year-old little girl who we've been back numerous times because my, my daughter does have a full sister. We've been back numerous times to, to be with her sister and be with their family. And it's just an incredible, incredible thing that I'm so thankful for and wanted to share it. And it was hopefully quick and it was true and I was on the road and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. very beautiful story. I have a terrible story. <laughs> um, so on the road, um, just this past summer, I was on the road um, in San Diego where my sister moved and where a good friend of mine was getting married um, and a really awesome friend reunion. And it was especially big deal for me because I'm relatively new to the car. I'm from New York City and so it was a big deal. It was my first time renting a car by myself and first time driving in a new city by myself. And so I was there a few days earlier um, and I kind of got to know the city. We called, we made fun of it and called it like San Diego and et cetera. But um, by the time my friends came a few days later, I wanted to like kind of show off. I'm like, I know this city, let me show you around. And I was like, I'll be the designated driver, I'm happy to do it. And, um, and it's easy to drive in San Diego because it's um, clean and it's sunny every day and there's no weather. So there's like no potholes, everything's labeled, everything's easy. So, but you know, I was driving and my friends were really obnoxious in the back seat and I was like kind of white knuckled and I'm like, guys, we can't listen to any music. And I'm like, please stop shouting, please stop having fun. And like, and, um, and so they were teasing me and stuff and Angel, my very good friend and like party girl, former roommate was like, dude, I would drive better on acid than you drive sober, so whatever. <laughs> and like, I was deeply offended. I also really wondered, I'm like, did you really, like, do people really drive on acid? Like, <laughs> wow, that's like amazing. And, uh, and I think she did, but so, so anyway, fast forward to the wedding. It was so lovely. It was in Balboa Park and my friends are foodies and they happen to be gourmet chefs. They grow their own food on rooftops in LA and there was a vintage ice cream truck with um, like artisan craft ice cream that was basically the best ice cream ever. And there was like taco trucks because it's Southern California and seafood to die for and lovely dancing and flowers and sunsets. And then Balboa Park had a close. So we had to find the after party. So we're in, we're getting into the rental car and all my friends pile up and we go to this family um, party, the party of the grooms family. And they're extremely wealthy and we walk in and there's about five to six Kim Kardashians and they're playing, they're playing hip hop really low and it's really weird. And there's like seven black lazy boy chairs. It's like a bachelor pad dream. And it's also like a teenage boys house party wet dream. Cause there's like a lot of Pepsi and pretzels, like lots of snacks and like lots of mixers. And me and all my freaky friends show up and all the Kim Kardashians are there and we're like, oh my God, this is gonna be something. And like. And uh, so we're trying to have a good time. It's my friend's wedding and there's a hot tub in the back because it's Southern California and there's a creeper uncle. I'm not really gonna really get into that part of the story, but he's like, girls, please, please enjoy my hot tub. <laughs> and my friend Alicia is there and she happens to be the only black person at the party and they're all calling her Rihanna and all the boys wanna get with her. And so we're navigating the waters of that tricky situation for my good friend Alicia. And anyway, so the point of the story is it's a very absurd, crazy party, and we're all happy to pile in the car again. Now Angel is the designated driver this time. So we've had all the seafood and the dairy and the dancing and the hot tubs and the creeper uncle and the Rihanna. And now we're getting back in the car and it's the United Nations of partiers like in the car. 
because it's angels from Thailand. Now she's in Brooklyn. Her husband is from Russia. They're in the front. And um, we're going to be in the back. And then Flo, the girl from France, who's a chain weed smoker and, like, <laughs> amazingly funny, she decides she wants to come with us. And all of a sudden, every, I'm dead sober. I'm like, no, we're not. We don't have enough seatbelts. I'm sorry. We just, we can't. <laughs> and I, I'm the lame one because, no, we can't pile all the people in the rental car. Okay, let me And, like, so I'm like, no, we're not doing it. So Angel's like, whatever, we'll put her in the trunk. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, Angel, in the trunk. That's a good one. We put her in the trunk. <laughs> but it's like, it's a Subaru, so it's like, it's not like a trunk, trunk, like enclosed, like it's that little space. So Flo, the French woman, is in the trunk. Um, the Russians in shotgun. Angel's driving. Angel is driving. Alicia's in the back seat with me and my good friend Bonnie from New Jersey. And we're going, and it's fun because we love each other. We're talking about how stupid the party was and everything like that. And then something terrible happens. Something terrible starts smelling. I'm just like, Oh my God, something is really terrible. And nobody else is noticing. And Alicia hasn't spoken in like 15 minutes. And I'm just like, guys, something is really wrong. Something's wrong. And um, I'm like, something's wrong. And Bonnie's convinced something's wrong with the city of San Diego. So she's rolling down the windows and she's saying, there's something terrible in San Diego. There's been a chemical spill. Something's happening in San Diego. I'm like, no, no, it's coming from inside the car. It's coming from inside the car. And then I realized like someone something terrible has happened, like it smells like death and dying and sickness and terribleness and I, I realize like someone has definitely like gotten sick, vomited on themselves and I'm like I realize I have to take this very efficiently and also delicately because I don't want to like completely embarrass my good friends but I'm like guys, I know something's happened, I know, so just tell us, just let us know and, and I'm like looking at my friends to the side and they look clean and they look okay and I'm just like something's terrible and I have a gag reflex so I'm starting to drag so <laughs> and Bonnie says quit it quit it because Alicia starts dry heaving <laughs> and then like and it's terrible because if we all start puking we're gonna get in a terrible terrible accident and then Mitch of the Russian in the front seat starts saying oh my god you're so stupid you're so stupid why did you do that Angel has quietly the driver has quietly and wordlessly vomited on herself in her bridal dress as she drove the rental car and all of us. And so we're holding on for dear life and we're dry heaving and we get back to the, to, to the beach house and we all fall out of the car like a clown car and everything like that. And we're rolling and we're laughing but we're crying and we forget Flo. And Flo's like, hey guys, guys, guys. And, and we let her out and Angel takes off her bridal dress, throws it in the trash and and yeah, and we just ask her, like, Angel, Angel, are you okay? I'm so sorry. We're like crying, laughing. Oh my God, why didn't you tell us? Oh my God, are you okay? And she goes, Guys, I'm okay. I just, I didn't want you to think I was a bad driver. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to tell is a story about um, when I was on the road, it was in uh, 2009 with my husband, and um, it kind of had some twists and turns. So we actually found ourselves over in, um, in Cambodia and Sim Reap, and I don't know how many of you have seen Tomb Raider, um, but Tomb Raider is an Angel Jol Angelina Jolie movie, and it was one of those places, a temple, where all the trees are growing up literally through the temple and through the walls. And so we started just taking pictures. Oh, you look like just like Angelina Jolie. And it was one of those really fun things that we ended up doing. And we actually felt a little bit like that. So that's sort of the theme of the story. Um, we stayed at a bed and breakfast right in the middle of, um, of Sim Reap, which is really unusual. This is a very poor country. And so to be there in a bed and breakfast where it seemed we have every luxury in the world, well, next door we could look over the fence and we could see children running around the yard with no shoes on at all. Um, and we knew that they didn't have much to eat, and there was really nothingness. There were no roads, um, there were no lights, there was really nothing. It was really a um, uh, luxury all, all around us. And we were told that we would have our own driver who would take us around, um, around town. One of our friends decided that she was going to go um, take advantage of the spa services who were there, that were there, and we decided that we would take advantage of this driver. So we went outside and we met the driver, whose name was Fang. And Feng um, started to tell us, okay, this is going to be, you know, where, he spoke very little English, you know, where to? So we tell him that we'd like to go someplace um, far away, that we would like to go see the schools. For those of you who don't know, I'm very um, passionate about education. 
um, which happened to be on the school committee. But yeah, so it was on, on the mind, and that was something that we desperately wanted to do. So um, we happen to notice as, as we go out, we're driving, and along the side of the road, you have to uh, imagine what this is like. The, the private car that we had was actually a rundown motorcycle that was pulling a rickshaw. Um, we were given handkerchiefs to put over our face for the dust and the, the stones and everything that flies you know, in your face as you go. And as we're passing, he said he needed to stop for gas. And we didn't see a gas station. We just saw at the side of the road a, a, um, a guy selling Coke. And it was just Coke bottle after Coke bottle after Coke bottle, but it was all yellow. And we couldn't imagine what that was. Well, the guy you know, says one of these, goes over and dumps the Coke bottle into the side of the motorcycle. And we're thinking, what is that? That's how they measure a liter of gasoline. Mm -hmm. So we keep going and he says, um, you know, here, you know, here's school. And we said, no, no, we want to go out further. Um, so, but on the way, we decide that we want to go buy a few things. We, wanna, we brought, brought some things from home. We had brought, um, we were told to bring toothbrushes and pencils and crayons and markers and books and things like that. And we decided to go to a local store and to buy more things, to buy Cambodian English um, books and, and the like. So we go out about, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes. It is so, so hot. We are dripping wet. It, we are gross. We're covered in grime. And he stops at another school. We say, no, go further. So we finally go to the last one and we get off and he's like, no, he's, he's going, no, you don't want to be here. And we're like, naturally, we kind of kind of do, you know? So we got off and we just went right on the playground and we see, you know, kids again running around all with bare feet and uh, all of a sudden they just disappear. They all disappear into the schools. And so, I don't know, we go over and we look inside one of the classrooms. It's all open air and there must be, I don't know, 40 kids in a classroom of all different ages. You know, there's a black, a, a green uh, board, blackboard at the front. So, you know, kind of poke our heads in and the teacher comes out and it happens to be English class and he says, you know, he asks, you know, who are you? Well, we're Americans, you know, we're just tourists, we're interested in your school, well, come on in. So he has us come in, my husband and I, who's actually here tonight, um, Adam's here tonight with me, and he says, he puts me at the front of the classroom, he says, you know, well, why don't you teach a class? I don't know, <laughs> I'm not a teacher. But we start to draw pictures. I draw a picture of the United States, I draw a picture of Obama, I draw a picture of shaking hands, I draw a picture of a heart. And, you know, it's how do you connect? These kids don't know any English, even though it's English class at all ages. We decide that we're going to share uh, singing. So we each share singing, you know, they, they have a song that they sing, I sing a song. Uh, it was really very exciting. We're taking pictures, they're all smiling. The head teacher comes in and wants to know what's going on. So, of course, I get the grand tour. He brings me out and he says, um, you know, I, I, he starts to say things to the English teacher who's now the, the translator. And he says, would you like to find out about our new technology? I said, yes, I would love to find out about technology that's out here. This is great. He walks us up to the back and he shows us their very first water pump that they had gotten for the children to give them drinking water. And they started to talk about the generosity of the, the last tourists who came five years before that promised that they would send money to build this pump. So they started to tell me, so as we're asking questions, they start to show us the garden that they had taught the children how to tend to so that they could add to their one meal a day that was provided in this little shack that Oxfam provided, this big um, dish that they would mix just rice. Rice was their one meal a day that they would have all of these children, but yet they were taught to garden. And so we met some of the children who were gardening. And so... Um, that was very moving. And so uh, one of the things that we did, you know, at the very end of it, you know, we wanted to make a donation. So I don't know, we didn't have very much American, we hadn't even changed our money yet. So we happened to give him a $20 bill of just like, you know, to, to the guy who was translating for us. We come to find out that's a month's salary for him. So he was just, I mean, crying. He was just so thankful. And he says, you know, how is this? How is it that you, you know, you came by? And we said, well, why would you do this on your vacation? Is that five minutes? So. He, is that six minutes? <laughs> um, so, uh, so anyway, he says, why would you do this? So he said, well, we really want to know about your life. We want to know what it is that you do. And he says, well, would you be interested in finding out? He's like, in my village next door, I have somebody getting married. It would be so auspicious if you would come. We said, yeah, we would love to go. So we hop on the back of this guy's motorcycle, and we go through the woods, and we're going through the woods, and we're going through the woods, and we come upon, in the middle of nowhere, I feel like it's this other lady's story, it's not the Buddha, but close, <laughs> and there we see this village, and we are, are the honored guests at this wedding. And um, I can't go through all of the detail, but just suffice it to say that we saw kids wearing 
clearly ripped hand-me-downs like things had been worn for years and years. We saw the Oxfam bellies, the, the distended bellies of these children. You know, we saw children who clearly had, you know, disease. Um, but yet there, were, there was a small wedding party. There were three people who had rented dresses. There was a small tent, a band of musicians. And we were at the front of the parade of this um, husband and, you know, the groom and the bride who came down. And the bride and the groom come together and they walk down the aisle. And then we're asked to cut the bride and groom's parents, the elders, and everybody else in order to go up and to be part of the ceremony. So we literally went up, and there they are, you know, and they're just, you could see it in the, in the movie, you know, you've seen the pictures of these um, beautiful Cambodian, Asian uh, dress, everybody else is in shambles except for them. And uh, so they say you have to be in the, in the ceremony, and the ceremony um, includes my husband, I have to spray uh, perfume all, all over the two of them. And my husband is in charge of the golden scissors to cut their hair. So he's told that he's got to cut their hair, the bride and the groom, and then pose our picture. Their one picture that's going to go in their little hut is going to be their wedding picture with my husband and I, grimy, gross, soot covered, cutting their hair and posing with this beautiful what well, We were told to put the hair on the plate, they would cover it up, and that that would bring them great, um, great riches. And so we found that to be a great hint of slip for money, you know, underneath yes. the handkerchief, right? So that they could find that. Well, we put about $100 on there. They nearly mm-hmm. fell over. You know, they really were like, unbelievable. This is unbelievable. You're so incredibly generous. So we actually felt that the, the, great, um, the great honor was obviously ours. We hope that they are not today regretting that we, we were in that picture. But suffice it to say that, you know, this, um, I know that my time is up, but this two and a half week journey ended up being following nonprofits. We had a, a guide. We ended up um, working in a, a, a place where the deaf were raising money for their own orphanages, pulling kids out of garbage dumps, uh, training women who um, were ostracized and, and were abandoned you know, to, to, um, to use sewing machines. And like all those stories that you hear about, we were living. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, we ended up actually, we bought for $20, we bought an entire orphanage shoes for the entire orphanage, $20. Our dollars went so far. And all we could say was, I really feel like Angelina Jolie. This is really a, the most incredible, most generous thing we could do. And I will just end with, in terms of generosity, that when I came out of that orphanage, my family all said, I cannot believe, I have three beautiful boys, like I cannot believe that you came out of that orphanage without a little girl you know, to take back with you. But I have to say that, you know, in the generosity of my husband, we did wind up with a, a little girl, but has four legs and from the MSPCA up the street. <laughs> anyway. So I grew up on a small island about 100 miles wide and 35 miles 100 miles long, 35 miles wide. Uh, The tourism board will have you think that it's a continent, but it really isn't. (laughs) So needless to say, my childhood, I spent a lot of time in the car, but it's not that I got very far. But somehow, even at that early age, I thought I had this longing for the thrill of the open road, whatever that was. So, um, but I found out that I had two big strikes against me, one of which was my, my geographic limitations, and the second of, uh, of which was my um, <laughs> protective parents. Um, so on the one hand, terrible gridlock, nasty drivers, and if you got out of the city, country roads that made me puke, and on the other hand, ay bendito cuidado, bajate de ahí, Dios mío, roughly translates as overprotective parents. So, um, (laughs) rather than the thrill of the open road, when I was a child, I I could at least uh, have the thrill of the open sidewalk of my cul-de-sac, so I took up roller skating. And on my 12th birthday, my loving, loving parents gave me the present I will never forget, a pair of gleaming white leather roller skates with um, silver, sparkly silver wheels with a silver stripe up the side. It was amazing. I couldn't believe my luck. And then the second box had uh, a helmet and matching elbow, shoulder, and um, knee pads. And 
Excuse me, who wore protective equipment in 1982? My life was over. It was terrible, it was terrible. So, so that very day, I realized that I would never, at least as a teenager or high schooler, have my own car. So at 16, I got my drive, my learner's permit, but I didn't bother with my license. I became one of those people, the queen of bumming rides off my friends as long as it was you know, within a three mile radius of my house and then I could call my parents whenever I got there, wherever there was. Oh, I were protective parents. Um, so, uh, fast forward to my graduation from college, my college graduation. I'm now in New Jersey, and my parents, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that they're helping me buy my first car. I got my driver's license, and they're helping me buy my first car, Mazda 626. Really, really great. Uh, and uh, included in the deal was this newest technology big, you know, shoebox size car phone right stuck right there, right? So I could always be within a call's, you know, distance. Um, lo and behold, I get my first big job after graduation as a college admissions officer, and this was great, because it meant a lot of uh, traveling, visiting high schools, and they sent me to places such as New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, LA, that's a whole different story, and um, so this new driver was heading out to all these places, driving long distances, it was awesome, in a rental car, which read, no car phone, right? This is before sales, you know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but th this all came to a test. Uh, yeah, of course, my dad had to have my entire itinerary. Every school I visited, what time it was, I would call him when I got to my next hotel in the next town. You know, we all have to deal with whatever, you know, hand you're dealt. And so I thought, well, this is better than nothing, right? I just, I'm, a, I'm far away, I'm in the open road. I'm a big girl. So then I get assigned to travel around Florida, uh, all across Florida. And this was a problem because this was right after the summer where unfortunately the young German tourist got, if you remember this, got abducted from a, from a, a rest area and found murdered and it was, it was horrible. So this was really testing my dad's mettle. And uh, he was particularly, he was trying to hold back but I could tell he was very nervous. But I was really enjoying my little, self-picked motels with the pirate motifs and, uh, and all that. And so uh, this one particular day, it was beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day. Of course, I'm in Florida. So I'm going from Vero Beach up uh, a, a turnpike to Orlando. It's about a three and a half hour drive, I think, if anybody has driven that. And there's nothing between Vero Beach and Orlando. <laughs> So, so I'm faced with a whole day cranking up the stereo and driving on this turnpike and the unthinkable happens about halfway through. My car breaks down. My car breaks down and uh, luckily, I guess, about 100 meters from a rest area on the other side of the, of the highway. So it's sunny, it's not rush hour, I guess. I, I, do what I think I need to do. I cross the five lanes of traffic to go to this rest area and call on the payphone, call Enterprise and say, oh, thrifty, I'm sure it was, and to say, you know, you need to come get me because my car just died and, and I'm on the side of the road. And of course I thought, I gotta call my dad. <laughs> so I call my dad and I say, you know, I just, I had this little issue with the car, but I, you know, I'm right next to a, a rest area and I just called uh, Thrifty and they're going to come and get me a new car. So, you know, I'll be in the hotel a little later than usual, uh, than, than you expected, but I'm okay. I'm a big girl. <laughs> so I wait half an hour, an hour, two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, it's starting to get dark out and uh, Enterprise keeps saying, oh no, we're almost there. But I'm thinking, I better go back out to my car because I, I need to connect with these people. So, so I go out to my car, I cross the five lanes of traffic and I sit in my car and I'm not feeling like such a big girl anymore because it's getting dark and uh, lonely. And all of a sudden a big black car pulls up right next to me, lowers the window. It's, he says he's a state trooper, and he says, Evening, ma'am. Are you doing okay? Are you okay there? And I say, uh, Yes, sir. I'm okay. And he says, What's your name? And I reluctantly tell him my name. And he said, Ha! I just spoke to your dad. <laughs> so, so, you know, equal... <laughs> yes. The, 
pre-cell phone, he figured out my location by how long I had traveled before I called him, which rest area it was, and somehow convinced the local state police office that I was in terrible danger, go take care of my daughter. So equal parts mortification and relief, he says, I'll just, and, and I'll just wait with you right here. So 45 minutes later, he chews out the guy from, from the car rental company. Uh, they get me a new car and I say thank you and I get on the road and I get to my uh, destination. And uh, so I recently told the story and uh, somebody asked me, well, you know, we all turn into our parents. Would you to do that to your daughter? I said, well, of course not. That would be silly. <laughs> By the time she's driving, I'll have her set her wearable communication device to ping me every 15 minutes. And then, if she doesn't answer my texts, I'll have uh, my, uh, my drone locate her via the uh, GPS chip implanted in her neck, and all will be fine. Thank you. Teenagers were coming to ruin our sanctity of storytelling. I like to get in touch with my audience a bit. Uh, jokes aside, I don't leave my house often unless I have a reason, you know? I'm overloaded with homework, sleep deprivation, but I spend a lot of time on my internet. My internet. I'm not very good with words at the moment, clearly. Um, but I spend a lot of time on the internet, and I got into, recently, watching live streams of video games, and I watch these till, like, the sun comes back up, and I fall asleep with my tablet on, with the stream playing. It's like my little lullaby, almost, from when I was, like, two years old, only it's often profanity screaming and men with beards. <laughs> God help me. Um, but I'm 17, almost 18. And so on one of these streaming websites, the one I go on is called Twitch, I was happening to be in the right place at the right time. I watched, I searched up a game that was from my childhood called uh, Super Mario Sunshine. Best game. Please play it. Um, so I look it up and I'm like, I never type it into the chat. But that day I did. And that day I met the best friends I could ever have and they're all over the internet. So fast forward to last August. I started talking more seriously and in teenager talking doesn't mean a little chit chat it means a little flurry flirt um, so I was talking to this guy and I, I don't like long distance things they're annoying like ugh, I can't I can't deal with the distance but one day he was just like hey I kind of like you actually and I was like hey I kind of like you too so then we became a thing and then he decided that he wanted to visit and he lives in Missouri <laughs> he lives in O'Fallon Missouri which is two plane rides away and many hours so I confront my parents about this and you know kind of building off the last story I have Overprotective parents. Hi, mom. Uh, she's in the back. Um, so my dad is a corrections officer from Poland, and my mother has parents who are very active in the Mormon Church. They're all for it. I'm very confused. <laughs> so he and his mom, his name's Devin, his mom's Tanya, they fly out here from O'Fallon, Missouri, and, oh my god, that was, and this is last week, by the way. <laughs> um, 
So we're like, oh my god, this is amazing. Well, you traveled all the way here, not for colleges, for me. And of course, my dad being big buff corrections officer from Poland with the Dorchester accent. <laughs> We're sitting the last night he's here. By the way, this boy and his mom were here for 36 hours only for me. This little shut in with the colored hair and the freaky and the unconventional and the, oh my. So he was here for 36 hours for me. And so the last night he's there, we're sitting in Dungarens, which if you're from Newton, which I suspect most of you are, you probably know or have heard of, especially since Jerry mentioned it in the beginning, you know. So we're sitting in Dungarens, and Shauna comes over to us, and we've known Shauna, the owner of Dungarens, forever. I have known her since I was, like, a baby, practically. My parents have been going to Duns for years. Shauna sees us, she's like, oh, Ashley, oh, family, woo-hoo! Um, and so my dad looks at Sean, I'm like, big buff corrections officer, father with the Dorchester accent, the Dorchester accent. And he says, Shauna, Shauna, this is Devin. Devin is my daughter's boyfriend from O'Fallon, Missouri. And he is here for 36 hours to visit my daughter. So of course then Shauna gets all her waiters over here and they're like poking at the poor boy like he's some kind of science experiment but he's loving every minute of it. My dad's just standing there like... <laughs> and so I guess the moral of this story is my dad has had a few choice words to describe my other ex-boyfriends such as worm, <laughs> scumbag, you know. And then here he is, the last night he's here, he's saying, Devin, you can come back anytime you want and our couch is open. So that's my story. And <laughs> Fifty years ago, last month, when I returned to Newton after four and a half years as a naval intelligence officer in the Middle East, North Africa, and finally on an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. I went to the aircraft carrier. I was supposed to be a squadron intelligence officer. And I, this was the aircraft carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt, which was about 24 years old at the time. It was a bucket of bolts. And, uh, but I was only going to be one squadron intelligence officer. I got to the ship in the Mediterranean, and I was informed by the operations officer that I was going to be the ship's intelligence officer because the, uh, the one that was on the ship had gotten sick. And I had no idea what I was doing. And because um, I had never been on a ship before, I really hadn't been. And um, but they said you should go down to to the intelligence office and meet a first class named Ken Knuth, and he'll square you away. I said that, that's fine. So I went down, and I met Ken Knuth, and I said to Ken Knuth very honestly, I said I have absolutely no idea about what I'm doing here. <laughs> and Knuth said. Nobody on this ship has an idea. <laughs> but, but he said, you know it, so you're going to be all right. <laughs> and, and, and he said to me, we, we bonded right away. You know, officers and listed people are not supposed to do it, but we, we were very simpatico right from the beginning. He was, he was great. And um, again, as I said, we had a ship that was supposed to do 30 knots an hour. If it got over 23, it just rattled and shaked. And they had old airplanes on it and everything like that. About this time, the aircraft carrier Enterprise, which was a, this is America's first nuclear submarine, a nuclear aircraft carrier, came into the Mediterranean. And it was on the beginning of a worldwide tour. It would cruise. It would show that a ship, a nuclear ship, could sail around the world without refueling. It was the idol, it was the, it was the Navy's pride and joy. And everything was geared to make it look as good as possible. So it had the most modern radar equipment. It was computer, entirely computer run. 
and um, um, we we uh, so so, but the powers that be powers that be said we were going to have a joint exercise to see which aircraft from which ship could fly over the other one, could elude the other ship and fly over it. That was the idea of the exercise. We supposedly did not have a chance. Um, and everything was supposedly stacked against us. And um, we didn't, but, but the second day, Ken, Ken Knuth came to me and said, Mr. Burke, he said, I've got an idea. Ken Knuth had been an avid reader of ancient Greek Roman history. He said, we can put this damn ship into a harbor where I know that the radar from the other ship can't see us. And I said, yeah, okay. He said, I know because he said, I've done all the work on this over the last year. I've been, I've been doing this. We can put the Roosevelt right in that thing. Which, and we said, well, like, the powers that be will never buy off on that. But I said, I'll, I'll back you up. So we, we finally got up. We, the operations officer said, no way. But we finally got up to see the captain. The captain said, I like it. I like it. And he was a cowboy, kind of a cowboy, a great guy. So what happened was, we, we, we over the next few days, we developed the plan. And uh, we got it. And, and our, idea, our idea was this. We would sail the thing into this harbor at, 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 at just be just as the exercise was was starting, we knew their radar wouldn't be over that area. We snuck in there, turned the boat around the <coughs> harbor, and there it was. And we had total blackout on the ship. Nobody moved. Nobody moved. And up, and we just stood there. And about half an hour later, we could hear the Enterprise planes flying all over the place. They kept going. And we got the first break, they launched every freaking plane they had. <laughs> That's what we wanted to have happen. And, and, and we, we were just like this. And, and, and everything seemed to be going good. And then suddenly on the hillside, the little Greek villa houses, the lights started coming on because they could see us down there. And the thing we said, oh my God, we're going to get screwed. Oh. But, 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 but what happened, we didn't. We didn't. They flew over. They kept flying over. And at the last minute, they started, they had to go back because they were out of fuel. <laughs> and when they were out of fuel, the captain came over and said, right, get this fuck on the road. Turn the ship around and launch the planes. And there was this admiral who was always on this ship. He was a pompous ass and everybody disliked him. And he had the congressman on the thing to show them the beautiful ship. He had the contractors and everything. And he was always strutting around the thing. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, just as it did, our planes roared over the Enterprise. And all of our planes got launched. And the real crushing blow for that other side was we had we were the only ship that still had propeller planes and the propeller planes <laughs> came over there and all of them were there and we 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 did this and uh, 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 and we did it and Ken Knuth because he knew Greek history and he knew he knew this thing he he was able to outmaneuver all this stuff. The powers that be embargoed that whole thing they made it classified. <laughs> And, 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 and the only last thing was, I, I recommended Kim for, 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 for a big award, which he got, and I said, and he said, well, you should get it too. And I said, no. I said, I had absolutely nothing to do with this. And the compliment he gave me was this. He said, my other two bosses I had would never have done what you did. You had faith in me. I said, well, I guess that's half the battle. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. So this is a story, it was a long time ago. Um, it was an ACDC concert. It was in the uh, venue formerly known as the Worcester Centrum. And it was gonna go like this. My brother at the time was uh, in school in Worcester. He was going to Worcester Polytech. And we were gonna go out there, my friend Gary and I were gonna go out there. And he was gonna, we were gonna go and have dinner with him and he was going to take us down to the Centrum so that we would know the way back. So we're going to go down to the Centrum. Uh, we're going to go down to the Centrum. He's going to walk us back so we know the way back. We walk out. He says, you go down, this, down the hill to the Pizza by Notice. Take a left to the Centrum. 
come out of the centrum, take a right, pizza by notice, take a right. We do this about a hundred times. <laughs> My older brother does not want to be the one losing his younger brother, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want to be responsible for that. So eventually we go to the concert, right? We have dinner, we go down to the concert. Uh, needless to say, I don't remember any of the concert. I remember the directions. <laughs> Come out of the centrum, take a right, go up the hill. Pizza by notice, take a right. <laughs> Apparently, we didn't factor in the fact that buildings have more than one exit. <laughs> and if you go out the wrong exit and take a right, you take a left. <laughs> so there we are walking into deepest, darkest Worcester. And if you were ever in Worcester in the 80s, the whole city was like a neighborhood for a bus station. It was uh, sort of bombed out businesses. But we didn't care, right? So we're 14 year old boys and we just went to an ACDC concert and we're really excited and we're, you know, we're, we're expositing about uh, Angus Young's fret speed and, you know, other guitarists with talent. We're talking about uh, ACDC vocalist Brian Johnson uh, and, and former ACDC vocalist uh, Bon Scott and talking about um, you know, the, the, the tragic martyrdom of rock persona who die choking on their own vomit. We're, and we're walking, and it's getting darker, and it's getting later, and we're not really talking about the fact that we're completely lost, but we're completely lost. And we're just to the point where we, where we sort of have to entertain a plan B, which I'm sure is going to involve sleeping on the street and subsisting on gum scraped off the sidewalk. <laughs> when, like a beacon of hope, a square in the distance, pizza by notice. <laughs> okay, cool. Who knew it was six or seven miles away? <laughs> so we go in, and it's almost closing time, right? And there's one guy, and he's, he's, he's wiping down the counter. And I go in, I say, so how do I get to Worcester Polytech from here? And he looks at us. He says, oh, boys, you are so not where you want to be. <laughs> Apparently, there are two pizza by noses <laughs> on opposite sides of town. So he's swiping down the counter. He says, OK, tell you what. I have a delivery sort of over there. I'll drive you. And, and, and why don't you sit down? Somebody ordered a pizza about an hour ago and they didn't pick it up. So here, here's a large pepperoni and, uh, and olive pizza that you can enjoy. And I'll drive you in about 10 minutes. And so contrary to all parental advice, we eat this food provided by a stranger. And we get in the car. <laughs> It, obviously, it doesn't end tragically, I'm here. <laughs> um, but we find out how far away from Worcester Polytech we really are. You know, it's, it really is like a trek back, and we're like, where are you really taking us? Because at some point, you realize, like, maybe this was not the car to get into. <laughs> but he's, he drives us back to Worcester Polytech, and he pulls up behind the dorm, and, and at this point, we're falling over ourselves with gratitude. It's like, oh my god, how can we ever thank you? We would have died out there. You know, how can we... <laughs> <laughs> and he says, and he pulls out of his pocket two pamphlets, religious tracts, <laughs> while walking the paths of life. These are the names. Of, and he hands one to both of us, and he says, um, boys, just read these. <laughs> and we're like, okay, yeah, yeah, zip, gone. <laughs> And the, but the punchline of the story I find is that my friend Gary, two years later, became born again. <laughs> and I just expect complete strangers to do completely wonderful things for me, like drive me home. Thanks. <laughs> Grab one of these. The worst thing that ever happened to me on the road was spending the night in a whorehouse in Jackson, Mississippi, <laughs> because it was too late to go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is a story of 25 years ago, but it really started about 20 years before that, and it has to do with airplanes. We know 
that nothing heavier than air can fly, right? Yeah. So my love of airplanes goes way, way back to zero. <laughs> the very first time I flew, it went down like an elevator. And my stomach went up to the Eiffel Tower. And I said, dear God, please let this plane land on terra firma, and I promise I'll never fly again. Well, of course, about a month later, I flew again. And what happened? Because it was many years ago before stabilizers and other things, I said, dear God, please stop this plane from shaking. I promise you, I will never fly again. The plane got down safely. God relented. And time went by. And I forgot. And I flew again. I hate bungee jumping. That's why I've never done it. <laughs> I don't like very tall elevators. They make me really sick. So, 25 years ago, when my husband said to me, I'm going to be speaking in front of several thousand people, and it would be a wonderful thing for you to come along with me and share this wonderful convention in San Francisco. And I started thinking, well, it would take me a month to get there by covered wagon, <laughs> and it would probably take me a week or two to drive there, and I would have to take the kids out of school. But maybe I could do it. I could maybe swim around South America and come back. I really did not want to do this. But I said to him, all right, I'll go. But you know damn well if I go, there's going to be an earthquake in San Francisco. To which he replied, don't be stupid, dear. <laughs> Five days out there, it's just going to be an earthquake. Well, this was October 1989. <laughs> and we were staying in the Hyatt Embarcadero in San Francisco. And it was 5.04 p.m., actually 5.03 p.m. And I am standing in my underpants and bra in front of now, please don't picture this. In front of the mirror, <laughs> putting on makeup, getting ready to go to a cruise that is going to have incredible food and incredible music and an incredible time. And suddenly, my lipstick goes like this. <laughs> and I think, what the hell? And I turn around and I think, something's not right. And I go, ah! and I hear, boom, boom, boom. And I think it is the green giant coming down the street. And I'm on the 13th floor, and I can hear him. I say, Nelson, what's happening? And he says, I don't know. And he's lying on the bed, jumping up and down, like flopping up and down like Raggedy Andy. And I bite like this, trying to get to my room, into the room from the bathroom. And the room's going boom, boom, boom. And I lie down on the bed too, because I figure the lamp fell over and there's sparks flying. The television set fell over and there's sparks flying. I'm dying, I know I'm dying, I better get in bed. So I lay down on the bed, at which point it stopped. It was seven hours later. On my watch, it was 20 seconds. But it was seven <laughs> hours later. I can tell you the longest 22 seconds I have ever lived in my life. So there I under my underwear. There he is on the bed. And I say, we got to get out of here. We can't stay here. But you got to stand under the door thing. And he says, and he says, I said, what's happening to your physicist? You know what's happening? What's happening? I tell me. And he goes, I don't know. So I said, OK. I know, and I take charge. I say, get your clothes on. I get my clothes on. I say, grab our passports. I think they went to China, I don't know. <laughs> I say, grab our passports, grab my jewelry. It was in the days when you still took jewelry when you went places. <laughs> so I have my jewelry, I have my passport. I said, make sure you get your wallet because we're gonna need money to get out of here. Now remember, I didn't tell you this, 
but this was the very first time we went somewhere and didn't rent a car. So here we are in this hotel that just got smushed by God. And I wasn't even in an airplane. And we don't have a car. But first we gotta get out of the place. So 13 floors, I'm not getting in that elevator. I can tell you the way that building shook, I'm not gonna be in there. So I open the door and there's a woman standing there and she's screaming. I said, what are you screaming for? It's over. And she says, I'm scared. I said, fine, follow me. <laughs> and I march and I find the stairs and the stairs are split like this. Here's one step, here's the other step, and there's space. 13 floors down between the two steps. And I say, okay, we're going to do it. Hold my hand. I figured she could pull me back if I fell. Anyway, I jumped down that step. I jumped down the next step. He's following behind. He's got the passports. And I stay near me, buddy. Okay, we get downstairs. We go outside because you can't stay inside. And we look up at the clock, the watchtower. What is it? The, the customs house clock tower. And there's a flag on the top. And the flag is normally like this. It's like this. And we look and we say, oh, God, we are so lucky to be alive. So what do we do now? We're going to the cruise. I want to get off land. I want to be on water. So we go out to the cruise. Now, these are the days when cell phones were just starting. Cell phones, is that, is that the noise? Oh, okay. Cell phones were this size. So I didn't have one yet. But he had a friend who had one. So we call and we, of course, Nobody's home. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But I want them to know we're not dead, so I leave a message. We're not dead. <laughs> I have figured that was enough. We go into, get on this boat, and what happens on this boat? There is a band in the back playing. There are ice sculptures that are gorgeous ice sculptures. There is food up the kazoo. And we are sailing in San Francisco Bay, watching the Marina District burn. <laughs> there are helicopters overhead with our lights shining down looking for floaters. We don't know what the hell's going on. There's no news. There's nothing. We are on that boat. We're supposed to come back to the wharf at 10 o'clock at night. The captain comes on and says, we're keeping you out here because the wharf is swamped with people who want to get back to Oakland and the bridge is down and we're afraid they'll get on our boat and sink it. So we're staying out here for another two hours. So we're out on the water all this time. We finally come back. We spend the night sleeping in the, the dining room, the banquet hall of the Hyatt Embarcadero with a thousand people farting all night. <laughs> the toilets did not work. They were overflowing. More to be coming next time. In uh, 1981, I was 27 years old. I've been a lawyer for three years. Uh, Ricky Smith, which is not his real name, uh, hired me to represent him for an armed robbery case, uh, a gun store in Fort Myers, Florida. Ricky was part of the Charlestown bank robbing Smith family. Uh, his father, his grandfather, had both the bank robbers. Uh, Ricky was a getaway driver by profession, basically. Uh, what happened is he's down in Florida with his girlfriend, Darlene, and uh, they run into to Sullivan and Tobin, who were two Charlestown guys who, even by the standard of the Charlestown bank robbers, are considered kind of crazy. And <laughs> Sullivan and Tobin tell them they're planning to rob a gun store down there in Fort Myers, and they want Ricky to drive. Ricky says, no. He says, number one, I'm on vacation down there with Darlene. And uh, number two, what do you think I am? I'm a bank robber. I don't rob gun stores. <laughs> but they're crazy. And they prevail on him, and he eventually agrees to drive. So that night, he goes out, steals a van, and they drive on a two-lane highway uh, in towards the center of the state. They get to the gun store. Sullivan told him, jump out of the van, run into the gun store, fire some uh, shots into the ceiling, tie up the clerks, and steal a couple of hundred rifles, thousands of rounds of ammunition, throw them in the van, and they take off back towards the shore. 
They're driving up a long, slow incline on this straight road with swamp on both sides. And Ricky sees coming directly at him the blue lights of police cars. <coughs> so he starts to slow down to find some place to ditch the car. Sullivan and Tobin tell him, just keep driving. He looks in the rearview mirror. They're loading the rifles, getting ready for a shootout. And Ricky said it's the scaredest he'd ever been in his life. Just as he's coming up to the crest of the hill, the police cars are coming right there, and they go whoosh, 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 right by him, responding to the robbery. <laughs> he drives back home to Darlene, relieved and happy. Gets paid. As I said, Sullivan and Tobin were stupid and loud mouths and talked, and two weeks later they ended up getting arrested for the robbery. And the police knew that there was a driver, and they knew that Ricky had been hanging around with Sullivan and Tobin. So they charged uh, Ricky with the armed robbery in Fort Myers, Lee County, Fort Myers. So I uh, went on the road to represent him. It was the first time I'd ever tried a case out of state. I got a local lawyer who sat me down and he said, what you got to understand about Lee County jurors is that this is not the northerners who are on vacation in Fort Myers. This is, as he, his phrase was, uh, hillbilly and rednecks who hate Yankees. And uh, I go there the first day for the trial and I figure he's probably right because the judge and the state's attorney during the entire trial call me nothing but the gentleman from Massachusetts. <laughs> so, and the gentleman from Massachusetts tells you, this goes on for three days, but as we're trying the case, they don't have any real evidence identifying Ricky as the driver. So it comes the fourth day, time for closing argument. I did something closing argument I had never done before in my life and I've never done since. I stood up, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to be an American. I came all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, and I talk funny, and I'm here with Ricky Smith, and he talks funny, but we're Americans, and you're Americans, and we're all Americans together, and it's great to be an American. <laughs> and, and because we're an American, we all get treated like Americans anywhere we go. You know, if you go to Russia, and you go someplace to try a case, you don't get tried like an American. You get tried like a Russian. In America, we treat everybody like... I went on about Americans for about eight minutes. <laughs> I spoke for about four or five minutes about the fact that there wasn't any evidence that Ricky had committed the crime, and then I closed it another five minutes on America. <laughs> Jury goes out for three hours, they come back not guilty. I was, I was overjoyed, and I was a young lawyer, so the first kind of out-of-state case I'd ever tried, I was really happy, really proud of myself. About three years later, Ricky is involved in a robbery of State Street Bank in Boston. He gets convicted. He does 10 years. Uh, but, but that's not the moral of the story is this. If you talk to Ricky Smith today and you ask him about that fiasco down in Fort Myers, Florida, he will tell you the biggest mistake I ever made in my life was to get involved in robbing someplace that wasn't a bank. <laughs> When you cross the street, you spend most of your time focused on the blind curve, making sure that you're not, you know, going to get hit. So, um, so our strategy for crossing the street is my husband and my son usually go across the street, and then I carry the stroller and you know gather, gather everything together, meet them over there. Um, well, we were going to the Run for the Nun, um, which is a, a Dungarans uh, or Shana Shana's charities. So we we're going to be doing the five. Kit to, the 5K pushing my son in a stroller. And um, anyway, as I was walking across the street to meet my husband, he said, Some something fell out of the stroller. Like something's in the street. And I turned around and and there's a pair of my underpants in the street. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, so so now I, I have equal parts, you know, embarrassment, but also, you know, what a feeling of uh, boy, you are a disorganized, girl. You are so disorganized because uh, what I do is I throw my laundry down the basement stairs and it pretty much lands in a pile, but, you know, it gets stuck here and there. But I never... <laughs> I mean, this is the first time, you know, in a public area something has fallen out without me, you know, knowing. <laughs> so, so I quickly um, I said the best, the best thing to do at this point is to stick it in my car because I'm still across the street from my house. I don't, you know, I don't have time to run up back to my house and do the right thing. So I, I, I put it in my car door and we do the run for the nun and two weeks later, um, 
I am driving home from the gym and it's dark, it's kind of cold, my nose is running. Oh, I gotta reach around in my car for something that I'm like, <gasps> oh my god, these things I, we meet again. Here they are again. And I'm like, why can't I just, you know, put that, put them in the right spot? So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I gotta have one of these sweatshirts on now that have the pockets in the front. So put them in that pocket because when I get home, I'm gonna put that downstairs for blunt. So, so, sorry. So, um, <clears throat> I'm <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> I lost my train of thought just a second. Thank you. <laughs> So they're in my pocket, and in my intention was to take them right down the basement when I got home. And, um, you know, I have a four-year-old son, so he was waiting for me to get home. He was so excited. He meets me at the door. Oh, my gosh, can you read me a story about what to go to bed? And everything happened. So three weeks later, um, <laughs> three, weeks, three weeks later, my um, husband's cousin, uh, Debbie, comes from Michigan to visit us, and they were going to Boston. Um, and, you know, they were going to spend the day there, and I was going to work, so it was kind of boring for me. And they're like, Patrice, you know, I, we, you know, they're texting me back and forth and taking pictures of where they are, and they're like, hey, you know, we, we're, we just scored tickets to the Red Sox game, so that's where we're going. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So, uh, you know, next thing you know, I get a selfie picture of them. They're in their seats, they're having so much fun. And I noticed that she's got my sweatshirt on. <laughs> And, and you know, she's got a, thankfully, a windbreaker. Oh, she's got a windbreaker over, but she, I see the hood and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, my underpants are still in there. <laughs> you know, like, they're in that pocket. I, I'm like, well, okay, I, I don't know what to tell her. I'm like, God, I'm, I'm kind of kind of jealous that my underpants got to the Red Sox game. I mean, <laughs> I'm stuck at work and they're at the Red Sox game. No, <laughs> but anyway. Um, you know, she, she comes home and she's, you know, she has not gone in the pockets and, and so she, you know, I got pretty lucky there. My decision was to not tell her. And, and so, you know, I did the right thing. I, you know, got the, I finally, I said this time for sure, got the sweatshirt from her and, you know, went to the top of the basement stairs and shut them down. <laughs> That's it. story about one of the weirdest car rides I've ever had. Um, so sometimes, you know, when you have get a boyfriend, you don't know what they're going to be like and you don't know what's going to happen. So the way this story happened was, it turns out my boyfriend was really into social experiments. <laughs> and you're going to find out what exactly a social experiment is in this story. So I'm driving with him. And he stops at Starbucks, and he's in there for like 20 minutes. And he comes back out, and he's carrying a paper bag of something, and I don't know what. Um, and so then he has me drive to this Bank of America ATM. And he goes into the ATM, and he's in there for a really long time as well. And he comes back out. And he's holding this paper bag of dollar bills. And he's like, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was young and stupid. And I didn't really know what was going on, but I drove. <laughs> I didn't really ask a lot of questions. I was like, OK, I didn't really know what was happening. And I guess I really thought he had robbed the bank. <laughs> because the next morning, I talked to my brother, and I was like, I think my boyfriend robbed a bank. <laughs> and so my boyfriend never had a chance to explain the situation. But the next day, he's like, you told your brother what? <laughs> and then he explained to me there was a social experiment to see how I reacted. And I completely failed. Because <laughs> Because he wanted to teach me a lesson about standing up for what I believe in and not listening to other people. And that lesson apparently did not work because I drove the car and did not kick him out. 
So, and then I had to clear it up with my brother and explain the whole thing, and he still doesn't believe me. <laughs> so the lesson is, don't do social experiments, and he doesn't to this day. <laughs> A story about on the road. It's, it's like a little thing that I think became a big thing because I was with somebody I cared about. Um, so I remember, I remember back when before GPS, um, when I was a small child, I remember watching my mother um, draw little maps for people who came to visit us um, on like napkins and sheets of paper, and um, you know she'd draw these very clear um, maps for people to get from Boston out of the city. Um, and I remember lots of discussion about 93 and 95 and 495 and I would completely glaze over um, <laughs> all of that talk and how long it took to get from this exit to that exit. Um, so it wasn't until um, I fell in love with a Michigan native um, and you know endured multiple 13-hour um, to 24-hour car trips from Boston to Michigan that I felt um, time and time again the need to tell about the enormity of, of those trips and um, you know, the number of hours it took to get from Boston to Buffalo, then from Buffalo across the Canadian border, and then from Canada to the lake, and then you know, one straight hour and we're in Flint and we're good. <laughs> um, so suddenly like, telling each part of that trip became, um, became something that I, I would tell to anybody who would listen. Um, and we, we made those trips for about four years. We made those trips at least three times a year. Um, and there were, there were you know, awesome things about those trips. We'd, Luke um, taught me about you know, every single chord of every rush and cure and um, <laughs> U2 song in, in his like 17 albums. Um, and I would read him aloud stories from my literary magazine that you know, pulled at every heartstring. Um, and on the other side of side of things, we would, um, you know, we would die from like inhaling too much caffeine and too much diet coke, and we refused to ever get a hotel, so we would um, drive overnight every single time. Um, so it was always this like wonderful and awful thing: Are we going to survive? Are we, you know, we start to smell like the car, we smell like each other. Um, <laughs> stomach ache? Are, you, are we going to get sick? Are we going to make it? Um, so one, um, one July 4th, the day after 4th of July, we're driving back from northern Michigan to Boston. We take off at 6 a.m., um, you know, euphoric and sun-drenched and um, ready for, for the, the marathon drive. Um, and we make it across Canada, and about three miles from the Canada-U.S. Uh, border, um, the, the, the moving highway becomes like a complete parking lot, and we're just stopped dead. Um, and you know we're, we know we're like in it for the long haul to get across the border and get through customs. So we roll down the windows. The sun is shining. We're playing music loudly. We just try to make the best of it. We're playing like the A to Z game. Um, as we get closer, we start to make friends with the people around us. Everybody is like next to each other, just step by step moving toward the customs, the customs um, booths. People are like walking to the bathroom. You know, you can be, take a luxurious trip to the bathroom, walk back, and be confident that your car will still be where it was <laughs> um, a few minutes before. And they start to send out uh, customs agents from the booths with dogs. So it starts to look like a, like a drug raid or something because um, they're trying to move people along more quickly. Um, so the customs agents start to approach each car individually. I have the passports ready. I've had them ready for the past like two hours, clutching them in my hands. I'm like so proud to get across the border. Um, and the custom agent approaches the car, he puts his sunglasses down, asks for our passports, Luke, you know, reaches for them, I hand them to him, and they, they drop between, into that, that black hole of every car, between the emergency brake and the side of the seat, and they're gone. <laughs> um, we were so ready, and then we were so not ready at all. Um, so, <laughs> Um, so we made some gesture and the customs agent just like throws up his hands and keeps walking and we, so we throw open the doors of the car. We went from like complete lethargy to like completely adrenalized. We throw open the doors of the car. We start throwing stuff out. Tim Horton's donuts are coming out. The, um, the dog starts sniffing our donuts. Um, we're tossing out like our, you know, our summer tubes and 
basically, you know, our life in the past few days. And, um, you know, and we have to try to move the seats and uh, somehow we fish out the passports and, and make it up to the, um, to the, to the customs guy. And we went from being so relaxed to now it's, now it's going to be a task to get, to get through. Um, so we coast through and we were just kind of like, did that, did that just happen? Did we, <laughs> did we just pause? And then, um, the end. <laughs> I had a story to tell, but I'm not going to tell the story that I thought I was going to tell. But I'm going to tell you a couple of things on the road. And they're silly little things that will only take a couple of minutes. So, I'm on the road with my husband and my twin sister, I have a twin sister, and my brother-in-law. And we're driving on a highway in Maine. We pull over to a restaurant. I gotta go. So I go. Now, not only is it my sister and my brother-in-law, but another couple, my other sister, I think it was a couple of sisters. It was a bunch of people. So I come back from the ladies' room from this stop. You have to watch this. So, Walking. People are looking at me and go, I'm looking, <laughs> uh, I'm looking pretty good. What do I do with my hair today? I'm looking pretty good. All right. Now I'm approaching the table, and the whole, to my sister, my husband, everybody's hysterical laughing. <laughs> what the heck is going on? And I look behind me. Do you know what happens? Roll. Not just a piece. <laughs> the roll is following me. <laughs> That's the first story. <laughs> the second story, on our honeymoon, 50 years ago, May 2nd. <laughs> So, the Fontainebleau, Miami. Peter said, my husband said, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to Spain? Do you want to go to Florida? I said, I've never been to Florida. <laughs> Stupido, huh? I said, okay, we go to Florida, Fontainebleau. So in Fontainebleau, they have a pool underground. I don't know if you, on the pool. And you can see there's a big window and you can watch through the window, you can watch people swimming. Well, there I was. I jump in. He's with some people we met on our honeymoon. I dive in. I'm swinging. I'm having the best time. I come up. Hysterical. They're laughing. Why? Because I have something coming out from my nose. <laughs> now, I am going up to the window and I'm... <laughs> and Peter's friend goes, is that your wife? <laughs> That's not uh, my wife. <laughs> so this is um, just a quick story. Um, I. I went to University of Hartford and then I transferred to University of Oregon and I was out on the West Coast. And I was kind of wild and um, wanted to um, see the country and, and have some adventures. So I hitchhiked back. Um, I hitchhiked from Sacramento down to LA and um, I think I had three or four rides on that, in that part of the journey and um, two of them were with women. Um, but that's not where the story is unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so I, I ended up in LA uh, with my friend Danny Factor, who's Max Factor's grandson, in Beverly Hills, and that was kind of fun to be driven around Beverly Hills and see how the other side lives. And he drove me off, he dropped me off in Bakersfield, and I was picked up by, uh, I was out there, I don't know, in the sun for three or four hours or something, 
Finally, these two kind of rough looking guys pick me up in their pickup truck and they say I can get in the back while they're driving across the desert. So it's getting kind of hot and uncomfortable and so eventually they let me into the cab and three of us are sitting and we had a good time and um, they said I could stay at their house. So we drive up and they say I could stay in the backyard. So I uh, made a little bed and stayed in the backyard and it was pretty close to the strip so I walked over and walked around that night and I think I got back around midnight or something and get up the next day to uh, you know I'm awake and have to do what I have to do in the morning and so I go over to the front door and I knock on the door and or I just look in the window and I can see the guy asleep on the couch they had gone out drinking and he's passed out on the couch so i figured well it's seven o'clock i'll give him another hour so i went back and i really have to go to the bathroom so i went back around eight o'clock and um, this time i decided i'm getting a little more ambitious so I, I knock on the door and um no no movement no sound no nothing and i have to go to the bathroom so i decided to go back uh lie down again and then Went back around nine o'clock and uh, banging and, and still passed out on the couch. So finally at around 11 o'clock, um, I'm really like banging on the door, <laughs> banging on the door. And he finally wakes up and comes and opens the door and I burst towards the, the bathroom. And that's it. <laughs> This happened before GPS, before Woodstock, <laughs> a lot of other things. I was uh, traveling for eight months, going, coming back around from around the world. And I was in La Hinch, Ireland. It was 19, September 1964. And I was this young thing looking. And a young man came up to me, younger than me, quite a bit younger than me, and said, he had an idea, would I like to go to Listoon Varno with him? And I said, Listoon what? And he explained that it was better than all the other festivals because there were bands with the best bands everywhere. And uh, I didn't know quite how I would go there because he said he, would not ha he didn't have a car. And I said, well, thank you, but I don't really go other places, go places with people I don't know in foreign countries. <laughs> and, um, he disappeared and he came back a few minutes later with another man, much older. Both of them were strange. They were both wearing suits and everybody else was wearing golf clothes. And uh, we went to look, they, they, I looked at the car and I said, oh my goodness, that's a rather small car. And I thought the two men would want to sit in front and I started crawling into the back, and as soon as I got there, here was the young man sitting, sitting next to me. And uh, off we went, and pretty soon there was a hand, and then another hand, and I began getting tired of it, and I said, stop the car, I want to get out, I'm going to walk home. And I got out of the car, and it was so pitch black, and there weren't any farmhouses anywhere around there, and I said, all right, I'll come with you. <laughs> and the, and the, the, man, the older man in the front seat said, it's going to be much safer up here. So I sat next to him, and it was maybe five, ten, it's only seven miles to Liston Varna. So it's about five minutes, ten minutes. I feel a hand on my knee, and I said, let us me just get out, and I'll hitchhike home. And he said, but we're almost there, just to over here. And we went over the crest of the hill. And there in this valley was this great big resort hotel. It was square and ungainly and four stories high. And every window, which seemed to be dozens and dozens of windows, every single window was ablaze with light. And the whole hotel was responding to the music of these great bands, and it seemed as if it was just dancing round in the valley, this whole great big hotel. Well, we drove down the hill, and the noise was incredible. You couldn't even think. 
and I slipped away from those two rogues and I got to the front of the hotel and I saw that there was this screened in porch and there were just a few people there. The whole point was a place where you could talk to people because you couldn't talk anyplace else. Everybody had to yell just to be heard over the music. And so I talked to this person and that group and this person and I was looking for somebody who was going back to La Hinge and nobody was going back that way. And I was feeling a little stumped. And I saw a priest sitting along on the, one of these um, wicker chairs with fancy car, you know, flowered car seats or, you know, seats in the, in the uh, middle of this. Uh, the, all the wicker chairs were kind of bottomless, so they kept putting pillows into them. In any case, I thought of the young man that I had met in Japan who had said that he was walking, he was from France, he had been walking around the world the other way, and he said, if I was ever in trouble, I should talk to a, a Catholic priest, and they would help me. And I said, but I'm not a Catholic, why would they do that? And he said, well, you don't have to be. He said, it's their job to do the right thing and to help people <laughs> when they're in trouble. And so I moved to a chair closer to the priest, and pretty soon there were people leaving and other people going, and we were about the only two people left at the moment. And I said, um, well, we started to talk. We introduced ourselves. His name was Father Power. And uh, he, was, he had a parish of his own somewhere in the north of England, a town called Bradford. And... Uh, he's, I, explained, I told him who I was and where I was going, and he asked he asked me my age and my marital status, and I'm thinking, what is this? And all of a sudden, he asked me if I was a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I am interested in why you wanted to ask me that. And he said, well, you see, a girl's virginity is the basis for her reputation, and I hope you're saving yours for because you want to be able to get married to a man who really wants a girl with a good reputation. And I thought, well, this is now or never. And I asked him if I could get a ride back to La Hinge when he was at the end of his evening, and he said, of course. And it wasn't too long before we started out. He said, let's go. And his car was at the parking lot. We had to go through the bar room, and it was just very crowded. And I, oh, that's right. it was very crowded, and I felt a pinch on my bottom. And I looked around, but I didn't seem to, it, the priest was right behind me. But I didn't think the priest would be doing something like that. And we got outside, we got into his car, he opened the door for me. He was not driving over all over the road like the two rogues had been driving. And I, I thought, well, this is a real gentleman. And he drove me back to La Hinge. And it was a wide front, you know, the front of the hotel was the only place in town that looked even vaguely open. But there was only one light in the whole town. And he drove in a U-turn and he pulled up in front of the hotel. And then the light went out in the hotel. And suddenly he slipped an arm around one side of me and with his arm he was taking me down backwards on the front seat and right over the stick shift. And I said, Father Power, what will the bishop say when I write him about this up there? Where is Bradford, England? And he sat up straight. He opened his door and he walked around the car and he opened up my side and he escorted me to the front door of the hotel. And if anyone were watching, they would see that this was a paragon of virtue of a man of the cloth saving a poor virginal girl from the United States. Good jobs, good wages, good weather. Vote all party today, tomorrow, forever. I want to tell you a story about Bob and Yoko. Now, Bob is my wife's brother. Uh, but you'd love Bob. Everybody loves Bob. He's a great guy. He's kind of wacky. Um, and he's a character. And Yoko is Yoko Ono. Now, Bob lives in Manchester, England. 
And many years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were going to go on the road. We were going to head out, see America, epic journey, back roads, small towns. At the same time we were doing this, Bob was going to come for his first trip to America out to see an old college friend in Wisconsin. So Mari and I, we headed out. We went on about three weeks. We swung by Wisconsin. We picked Bob up, and then we head on west. So as you imagine, there's lots of driving. I'm doing all the driving. Mari's beside me in the driver's seat. And Bob's in the back seat of our little car with all the camping equipment in a little cave. And day after day, and hours at a time, he would entertain us. And he would sing. He loves singing. He's a music teacher. And he's got a million songs in his head. And he's got a ton of crazy songs. And he loves to screw with you. So like he'll be singing like a Joni Mitchell song. Then it goes into some opera. And then like into a TV jingle. You know, he's always kind of playing with you. So one day, we're driving along. He's singing a song. He gets to the end of the song. And then all of a sudden, he goes right into the song with this high voice, the weirdest voice you ever heard. It's not his voice. It's like this strangled voice, this like hard to listen to thing. And it's like, what is, and he, he's singing, and we go, what is that? And he says, Yoko Ono. And he keeps singing, doesn't miss a beat. And we're thinking, yo, yo, who sings Yoko Ono? Uh, but anyway, he sings in this weird voice all the way to the end of the song, and immediately goes into a second Yoko Ono song. He sings that all the way to the end. He immediately goes into a third Yoko Ono. At this point, we're screaming, we're begging, we're pleading, like, you know, stop. And he's just grinning ear to ear and singing. He sings an entire side of a Yoko Ono album from beginning to end. Now, there is nobody else on planet Earth that I know of other than maybe, Yo maybe Yoko Ono who could do this. But that's our Bob. So I want to move ahead a couple of years. A couple of years later, Mari and I are camping down in Cape Cod, which we still do to this day. And our really good friends, Scott and Zini, are coming up from uh, New York. They're going to spend a week. They arrive. Before they're out of the car, Zini is talking a million miles an hour. She's telling us this insane story. A month before, she was out on a Friday night. She was going to meet a friend. The friend was late. She's bored. She looks down, and there's this application for an art show at the New Museum of Contemporary Art. Now, the show is going to have 30 artists. 20 of them are well-known contemporary artists. One of them is Yoko Ono. Now, the other 10 artists they are going to pick from these applications, and anybody can apply. So Zini, who's another piece of work, she just grabs this thing, fills it out, and says, for my piece, I'm going to organize a third political party, and it's going to be called the O Party, and I'm going to hold the National Convention at the museum. And then she puts this thing in and forgets about it. The day she's coming up to visit us, she opens the mail, congratulations, you've been accepted to the big show. So she arrives at our campground, freaked out. The show's in six weeks. She has no idea what she's going to do. So we spend the whole week around the campfire every night hatching these plans. So we think, okay, what are you going to need? You're going to need a stage. We're going to build a stage. You're going to need a lot of balloons. Uh, uh, you're going to need uh, logos. and uh, We're going to have to rope everybody we know into this thing. We're going to have to have signs. And we're gonna have to, it goes on and on and on. By the end of the week, it's got like crazy and crazy. We're going to have a parade. We're going to have bullhorns on the top of the cars. We're going to have secret service agents. So anyway, they go home at the end of the week. The next six weeks, we're on the phone, we're emails, we're roping everybody we know into this thing, and the plan is taking shape. Six weeks later, Mari and I, we get in the car, we drive down on Thursday night to, to Manhattan. We stay with Scott and Zini. Friday morning, we wake up. Scott and I take a van full of lumber and tools to this museum. Now, the opening's on Saturday. This is Friday morning. The museum's closed to the public. We get in there, and we're in this huge, empty gallery, me and Scott, and we're building a stage for the old party convention. How cool is that? And uh, about noontime, Scott goes out to get some sandwiches. He leaves me there by myself. I'm working. I hear a noise. I turn around. And a woman's come in way down there in this big gallery, put a box down, and walked out. And I said, that's your go no. <laughs> so a minute later, she comes back. And, and so she goes in and out three or four times. And I said, no, no, that's not going to go. No, that's your go no. Come back. Finally, she gets all her stuff. She starts setting it up. And I'm like, that is your go no. <laughs> so I go. And I, I walk all the way across this gallery. You can hear every step. It's a big empty gallery. I walk all the way up, and uh, I come up to her and I said, uh, "Excuse me." And she turns around. And I said, are, "Are you Yoko Ono?" And she says, uh, "Yes, I am." And I said, "Well, um, well, uh, uh, I, j I, I just want to tell you about my brother-in-law Bob. He's <laughs> your biggest fan." And I said, and I tell her about how Bob would sit and he would sing, sing whole sides of, our, of your albums. To us when we were driving in the car for you know hours and she looked at me and she said I am so sorry <laughs> so I want to end this and say that if you ever come to visit us on Cape Cod and in our campsite and you every one of you are welcome come on down next summer um, if you come 
you will probably meet Bob. He comes every year for six weeks. <laughs> and if you get there and you're lucky, we'll invite you to a beach fire. And if you come to that fire, I guarantee you Bob will be there. He will have his guitar and he will be singing. And sometime over the course of the night, maybe between like a Frank Sinatra and a Frank Zappa, he could just slip in a Yoko Ono song. <laughs> and if he does, at the end of it, he might turn to you and say, you know, Yoko knows me. <laughs> we got a thing going on. Thank you and good night.